Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me again for another episode of the Horses Advocate podcast. I'm so glad you're here. I try to make these things fun and personable, but sometimes I go into the weeds. And uh, I'm just going to be honest with you. I've already recorded this one and I didn't like it. And now I'm going to re-record it because I'm trying to get a message out that's a little bit complex uh, and, and, and es esoteric. Is that the right word? Uh you have to use your imagination. I guess that's what I'm asking you to do. So if you're driving, um, don't close your eyes. Stay driving. Uh, if you're mucking stalls, uh, you got to keep your eyes open. I get it. But I want you to dip into that imagination and join me in what I call my time machine. Because a couple of things have happened. And I want you to understand that where we are today in 2023 is absolutely fascinating. I mean, what I mean by it's fascinating is that we are so blessed. We have so many things going for us. It's almost impossible to actually talk about it. Um, because if you and I decide to sit down and look at all the things we could be grateful for right now that's making our life so easy, we could spend hours. So I'll give you a, a little short list. Some of the things that I think about every day. Uh, one of them is... Um, Hot water. <laughs> I love hot water. Uh, to think that I can just walk into my bedroom and turn a valve and see hot water uh, come out of a shower head and um, wash off dirt and sweat and sore muscles. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, another one is uh, microwaves <laughs> it's just or instant hot water heaters. If I want coffee, I just push a button and next thing I know in no time at all, I don't have to go out and chop wood and start a fire and get the kettle burning and, you know, all that stuff. It's just like push a button, have some coffee. Um, we can get in a car and go anywhere we want on smooth paved roads. And I'm talking about most countries. I know there's tons of countries that haven't come up there, but I lived in Florida, South Florida in 1973, where a lot of roads were still dirt and we had no interstate. It was 1972, actually. We had no interstate in this county. It, the I-95 did not come down here. So yeah, uh, this is my 70th year of life. And a lot of things have happened in 70 years. Like I had to get up and turn the channel of the TV. You know, I'm sure you've heard that a million times. Um, there's just so many things that are going on. I mean, the fact that I can just sit here in this little studio and record and push a couple of buttons and edit it and upload it by the internet. And next thing I know, I've got somebody on the other side of the planet actually listening to my words. It just, it is mind blowing, absolutely mind blowing to think that in such a short time, we we've, we've come this far. One of the things I think about as far as horses go is in my short career with horses, which is 50 years this month, I think about hay, I think about grain, I think about how we um, medically treat horses, prevent diseases. I'll never forget uh, one of my mentors walked into the barn shaking this foil pack and said, hey, we've got medicines now for parasites in horses. And of course, I said to him, what's a parasite? You know, because I didn't know. Um, but it was a top dressing we, we spread on the of food and most of us know that that didn't work so i kept begging them can you tell those guys to make it into a paste form so we just squirt it in their mouth i'll never forget actually asking them um i just find that fascinating just can you just make a paste out of it and miraculously i thought my veterinarian talked to the powers to be and a year or so later we now had pastes um, we didn't know what we were doing with them. And now we know that we probably over um, treated our horses. We didn't understand that they were living in filth. Uh, we didn't even understand anything about it. Uh, yet, um, the only thing we knew was, you know, we can get bacterial infections and you have to give antibiotics. That was about it. There's nothing else back in the 70s. We just, you know, we didn't know much. Uh, we did have hay come in. Hay was... Uh, by tractor trailer load. But even back in the 1970s, I didn't think that 20 years earlier in the 19 early 1950s, um, that we might not have had roads, interstate systems. They didn't come out to 1960. Uh, we didn't have tractors and we certainly didn't have bailing machines, not on any large scale. I mean, industrial people with a lot of money could buy these things, but to have a small farm and have your own bailing machine and tractors, 
didn't exist. So uh, how do we get hay? We cut it by hand. We actually lifted it by hand and put it on all these wagons and and the horses would drag them in and we would lift the hay up into the hay mow using horses pulling a rope that went over a pulley that was up at the top of the hay loft that would lift the, the um, bunch of hay up. And if you don't believe me, um, go to YouTube and type in something like uh, hay, uh, harvesting hay reenactments or something like that, uh, harvesting hay with horses. And there are people who still reenact these now. And it'll blow your mind because right now the bales of hay are come flying in. You know, usually you're not doing it. Somebody from the feed store is doing it for you. But if you bale your own hay, you've got machines that pick up all the bales and and plop them in the in the hay mow, and it's temperature controlled. So a lot has changed in, gosh, in the 50 years I've been with horses. Back in 1972, we would drive our truck down to the railroad yard and I'd pick up bags of oats. You guys are listening to my autobiography since the days of the Romans. Uh, either I've already talked about that or I will be talking about that. I'm picking up the uh, railroad boxcar full of oats for our horses because we didn't have slick uh, sweet feet. In fact, the first time we got sweet feet, I believe was 1976, uh, something like that. And it came in a semi tractor trailer. And we said, what the heck is this? Oh, they've added molasses to all the grains. And I said, well, that's kind of cool. Horses are going to love this, all this sugar. This is great. Um, and who knew that we were starting to cause the demise of our horses? But we should have known better because as humans, we've been exposed to sugar a lot uh, since uh, the late 1700s, uh, certainly uh, mid-1700s, right on through 1800s. We started to get see cancer and other um uh, illnesses spring up in the industrialized nations where they're eating high carbohydrate loads. So, uh, and not that I want to talk about slavery much, but slavery was driven by the sugar trade. Uh, if it weren't for sugar, maybe we wouldn't have need slaves. I mean, sure, there's cotton stuff. Uh, not that I want to touch on the slave uh, subject because it's very sensitive to so many people. But we have to look at agriculture that drove it. If it weren't for agriculture and trying to um, provide large masses of people with things that we couldn't get, uh, we didn't have a cotton mill or cotton gin. We couldn't peel apart the cotton to make uh, woven fabrics. It was, that's relatively new. Uh, our clothing used to be you know, cut from hides and, uh, and we wore them every day, right? There's no underwear. <laughs> um, Life has really gotten different. And because of that, we've become very comfortable. I've always said that eating at McDonald's doesn't make you fat. I think driving to and from McDonald's makes us fat. And if you and I wanted to go to any fast food joint and eat their food, and we had to walk there, and it took us two or three miles to get there or more, and the same to come back, we'd be burning up all that food. We wouldn't have to worry about it being stored as body fat. Um we got to look at the reason for uh, what's happening to our horses, the demise of our horses, the insulin resistance that's so endemic in our horses, the uh, Cushing's disease that it seems like everybody says, what do you mean you don't have Cushing's yet? Uh, we have people saying, oh, you shouldn't be vaccinating uh, your horses for uh, diseases. And that just happened this week. I had somebody ask me about the uh, vaccination. She basically said, I don't believe in vaccinations. And I said, well, you're, you've never seen a horse with rabies. You've never seen a horse with tetanus. I have. It's horrible. It is a horrible disease. And the vaccines are so good against deadly diseases. Um, now, the other diseases I'm not so sure about. Encephalitis, yeah, that'll definitely help. Uh, but all the other respiratory diseases, you know, maybe you don't want to vaccinate for them. If you're not into vaccinating, don't worry about it. But tetanus and rabies, absolutely. Because if your horse gets rabies, um, they can give it to you and then you will die 99.9% .9 of the time. Maybe it's 99.99% .99 of the time. Uh, not only will you die, but it'll be a horrible, horrible death. So um, just learn how to give vaccinations correctly by shaking the heck out of the bottle. Shake it, shake it, shake it, shake it. Tell everything you see in the bottom of that vial has been resuspended. 
and then draw up the syringe full of the vaccine, squirt it back in. Uh, don't take the needle out of the vial. Just squirt it back in and make sure you've gotten every nook and cranny of that stuff and shake it like crazy. It says so it's right in the directions. It says shake well before administering and nobody shakes well. I've never seen, I hardly see any vet. They kind of lazily kind of shake it back and forth and draw it up. But if you don't want any reactions from a vaccine, uh, shake it like crazy and keep them all separate. Keep rabies separate as a unique. If, if the disease is that deadly, it deserves to be standing alone as a vaccine. So you're focusing just on that. Same with tetanus. I mean, I'll never forget that horse that died of tetanus. And there's nothing I could do about it. Just nothing. You know, the guy just had never vaccinated uh, or vaccinated improperly the foal. Then he used a dirty needle to give him something and basically killed the foal. So um, what's my point? Uh, we are sitting in a time in our lives where everything seems to be so easy for us. And that's great. I don't mind that. We all like having a nice warm bed at night, uh, cold in our house when it's hot out or heat in our house when it's cold out. Uh, we love the transportation. We love hopping on a plane and flying across the country in five hours and, um, uh, it, I was just, it's just, life is just so easy. It's just unbelievable. If I want to go down to the local store and get any food I want, virtually any food, um, I've got it from some of the biggest distributors in the nation, from Walmart to, um, you know, all of them. They, they, they're all there, um, right within a five minute drive of my house. So, um, what is it about the evolution of technology? The ability for us to fly to the moon, uh, to telecommunicate between wristwatches, to uh, communicate with a visual uh, with my son who lives in the other side of the planet um, while driving. <laughs> I mean, it's just a miracle. And the evolution of the horse's digestive tract, which has not kept pace with what we're doing. So I have received this week no less than three individual people saying to me, I'm having trouble convincing the people in my barn that what I'm doing is right, that I should even be doing it. And they're all telling me that I'm crazy. And what's crazy is removing the horses uh, from the horse's diet, all inflammatory ingredients, and uh, then adding soybean meal or high quality protein source uh, because uh, the person is agreeing with me that there's something has to happen because what's work, what they're doing right now is not working. So they're constantly looking for something to help. And they're now believing what I s recommend, which is remove all inflammatory ingredients. Number one, number two, add in a high quality protein source. And I can understand why people are afraid because it's different. I can understand that change is difficult for a lot of people. Um, but you have to ask yourself, how's what you're doing actually working for you? And most people will say, no, it's not. I'm having suspensory problems. I'm having uh, drop fetlocks. I'm having Cushing's. I'm having insulin resistance. I'm having obesity. I'm having laminitis. I'm having skin problems. I mean, the list goes on and on. And you got to do something different. Just think about this time machine. And I went into a time machine th via a TV show that was brought by the History Channel called The History of Food. And I found it fascinating because I was stuck in a hotel and um, I'd already slept and then I got up and something was bothering me. So I just turned the TV on and I ended up watching two shows. You know, what's the chance of this? The History of Candy and The History of Cereal. And both of them were fascinating because they talked about the industrial giants, Hershey Candy, Curtis, if you never heard of Curtis, you've heard of Baby Ruth's and Butterfingers, that's Curtis, and Reese's Peanut Butter Cups, and how they all came to be. And it was basically men who were out to become the biggest and the best. Uh, one was more uh, helpful in humanity, uh, Hershey was. Uh, although he fired Mr. Reese from his payroll and Mr. Reese went out on his own. But the guy uh, who ran Curtis, whose name I can't remember, he's a German, I think his first name was Otto. Uh, he basically 
believed in marketing and his goal was to put Mr. Hershey out of business. That was his whole goal is to make more money than Mr. Hershey and put him out of business. Now, what kind of business model is that? I mean, I would think that veterinarians or horse professionals are there to do the best they can for your horse and to help your horse survive and even thrive in the human world. Uh, but these candy makers weren't out there to do that. They knew they had something that people wanted, that they were addicted to, uh, that had become popular uh, to use in World War I, believe it or not. It was World War I that uh, got candy uh, popular. They gave candy bars to the doughboys, the um, troops, uh, that and cigarettes, by the way. And they thought cigarettes and candy was the way to help our boys stay happy. And, uh, oh, yeah, stayed happy. And then all the things that happened since then, <laughs> lung cancer and all the other sugar problems all stem from the government giving us candy and cigarettes. But anyway, um, the story is really interesting because Mr. Reese discovered peanut butter. Uh, he had never seen it before, nor had America. They knew about peanuts, but they didn't know about peanut butter. And he combined chocolate and peanut butter to make the Reese's peanut butter cup, which Mr. Hershey uh, found out about because it's being made in his backyard and being sold to his employees. So he went in partnership with Reese and got him back in as a partner. And so all the chocolate you see on a Reese's peanut butter cup is Hershey chocolate. And that's how uh, Reese became the leading candy maker in the world. And the baby Ruth's named after the famous baseball player, Babe Ruth, but Babe Ruth wouldn't let him use the name Babe Ruth. So he decided to make it Baby Ruth. Uh, and there's a lawsuit after that. And Babe Ruth lost. And the Babe Ruth still exists today. And Butterfinger was another Curtis candy that only made it not because it tastes great, but because there's a product placement with an actress that was very, very popular at the time named Shirley Temple. And once everybody went to see the movies with Shirley Temple and saw her getting a Butterfinger and eating and said, mm, boy, this is good. Everyone went out and bought a Butterfinger. Uh, that's how powerful advertising is. And we get duped into this. We look at the pictures on the bags of these horse uh, feeds and they're four color. I mean, the bags sometimes cost more than the contents that are in them. And it's, it's very compelling. There's words on there that are... Uh, I don't want to say absolutely misleading. I mean, marketing, I believe, is all about misleading people into finding what their pain is and how they can fix it. So it's it's definitely leading a person to a solution to a problem they think they have. But then they throw in some words that are beyond our education and make it very difficult for us to understand. Uh, so I went into this feed room uh, this week. This gal is hired just to do the feeding on the farm i mean that's how many horses they have like 60 horses here during season and that's just an incredible job that she has to stay on top of because every horse comes in and they all want their horses fed differently so the feed room is very uh, large uh very well organized and i'm looking at the bags of feed that are underneath all the bins i said so what's this and i knew exactly what it was um i said that's a balance you're feeding right some sort of food that you feed to complete everything so you don't miss anything and she says yeah that's that's a balancer and i said do you know what's in it and she says no i said hey this will be fun let's tear off the ingredient tag and take a look so i tore it off put it on the table and, and read the ingredients to her number one ingredient in there of course was soybean meal say hallelujah i think it's great it's just not enough of it the second ingredient was wheat middlings i said you know what wheat middlings are it's the outer hull of the wheat uh, kernel that is is taken off so you can have some white flour. And they're floor sweepings. I mean, they're just basically byproducts, leftovers that they want to throw out and put in the garbage dump, but they figured they'd just sell it to you. And that surprised her because she didn't know what a wheat middling was. Then they had another byproduct, uh, I think it's sugar beet pulp. Um, so that was in there. Uh, so that's a byproduct of the sugar beet industry. Then I went on to uh, calcium carbonate. I said, do you know what calcium carbonate is? And she says, no. I said, have you ever heard of Tums? And she says, yeah. Well, it's an antacid. They put an antacid in here. How about that? And that really kind of screwed up her face because she's like, uh-oh, what's going on here? And then I said, look, then you have monocalcium and dicalcium phosphate. You know what that's for? She said, no. I said, that's for... Um, 
preventing rickets to make sure the horse is getting enough calcium in the food to offset the excess protein, uh, phosphorus that's coming in from these uh, grains that you're feeding your horse probably in other foods. So everybody puts in dicalcium, monocalcium phosphate to, and I said, did you know that that prevents the absorption of magnesium? And uh, when that happens, you get low magnesium, hypomagnesemia. I can't even say that right. Sorry. Low blood magnesium. I said, do you know what the number one um, sign of low magnesium is? And she says, no. I said, hyperexcitability. So everyone's adding magnesium to calm their horses down, but all they have to do is take away the grain. It would take away the inflammation plus the high calcium and phosphorus. So that's why the horses calm down when you take them off the food. And she's like, oh my God, are we, can, can we just stop now? I said, no, the next ingredient is the one you really have to listen to. It's called lignin sulfonate. And she said, what the heck is lignin sulfonate? I said, well, it's uh, number one use is for dust control and dirt roads. And she just said, what? I said, second is uh, make a, a slurry for uh, well dragging, digging. They add it to the dirt and water. So it lubricates the drill. Uh, third is uh, concrete production, especially sheetrock. Uh, fourth is precursor DMSO. And fifth was antioxidant for fire retardants and animal feed. And that's number five on the list. And she rolled her eyes and she says, you've got to be kidding me. I said, well, look, you're buying it. This is what you're feeding the horses. This is what you're being told to feed. And I said, I wouldn't. I would just feed uh, forage and add some soybean meals, a high quality protein. And you know what she said? <laughs> she said, I'd be out of a job then. <laughs> and folks, that's what it boils down to. This is all about money. It's all about having a job. It's all about creating uh, a candy bar that uh, is going to put another candy bar business out of business. Uh, it's all about competition. It's all about you know everything. And and don't get me wrong. I I, I believe in capitalism. I believe in all these things that I mentioned in the beginning. I love having a microwave and hot water heaters and water pumps, a uh, roof over my head. Uh, telephone wires or you know cell signals or fiber and i believe in all this stuff i think it's great i just know that my body has to 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 stay i have to be present in what really exists and make sure that what i'm doing is not being totally destroyed and this is why sleeping is so important because every animal on the planet sleeps uh, and if you're sitting up there uh, constantly playing games on your computer and you get your sleep down to four or five hours a night, um, it'll shorten your lifespan. And that's, you know, I'm... <laughs> there I go down another rabbit hole. Pull me up, please. Get me back here. Let's stay on track. Um, I did say that there was a history of food on the cereals. And cereals, of course, are grains that are put into a box and we pour it into a bowl and add uh, milk and eat it every morning. And uh, I did for a long time in my life. It, it was simple. It was easy. Uh, it made a nice midnight snack. It made a substitute for dinner when you didn't want to cook. Uh, it was there. It was so convenient. And when you add some fresh blueberries on top of anything, oh, my gosh, it just tastes so good. It fills your stomach up and you feel really great. Um and there was no evidence that I was taking a huge sugar load. Um, and that was uh, affecting a lot of things in my intestinal tract. But it was interesting because uh, the Kellogg's brothers were uh, two boys, uh, one to become a doctor. The other one was a high school dropout. And they decided to work together um, in a sanitarium. Dr. Kellogg started a hospital for uh, the mentally ill. And he believed that feeding whole grains was the key to the health, the mental health of all people. And so he forced everyone to have breakfast and he made it out of whole grains, which were baked into blocks and uh, that cooked and were dried. So in the morning, uh, these food preparers that in, the, that in the show were all women would take wooden mallets and they would just break apart these loaves of baked, dried uh, uh, grains. And that was the beginning of granola. That's how granola started. And some of the uh, inpatients the, or patients, they said, uh, we like to add milk to this to kind of soften it up. So that's where milk was poured on granola. 
and then one day by accident, one of the cakes uh, didn't draw, um, wasn't put in the oven overnight. So it was a doughy mess in the morning. So instead of wasting it, they ran it through a roller that they happen to have. And as it came off the roller, it came off in flakes because that's the consistency of it. So the, uh, the younger brother, the high school dropout, said, let me toast these. And hence, that's how cornflakes started. By the way, uh, the older brother, the physician, uh, was so demeaning and, and constantly uh, was abusive to the younger brother. And he just stayed there uh, for the longest time. But he actually was brilliant as an engineer. And he kept devising ways to make things happen. And it was obvious that they were onto something because he was able to um, make a lot of this stuff. But uh, one of the patients in there was a guy named C.W. Post. He was there for a nervous breakdown because he had lost so many businesses and he'd gone bankrupt and all sorts of stuff. And uh, he saw an opportunity. So he basically stole the cornflakes, uh, all the uh, ingredients, uh, the actual product, and uh, all the notes that the younger Kellogg had been doing. And went off and started to make his own product, which turned out to be grape nuts. Now, here's the interesting thing. Number one, he's a thief. <laughs> and number two, uh, he made a product that was similar to, but not the same. But because of similar, he made the assumption that because Dr. Kellogg was serving it and Dr. Kellogg was saying it's healthy, C.W. Post said, uh, these grape nuts are uh, part of your healthy diet, will help you uh, become healthy. And so marketing 101, you know, you're sick and my food's going to make you feel better. And CW Post uh, just took off. Uh, but Post wasn't happy that he made a product and start to make money and doing really well. He was an evil type guy. And he said, I just want to put Kellogg's out of business. I want to do whatever it takes to make sure that Kellogg's is is my competition is completely destroyed to the point where he bought all the machinery that Kellogg's needed to buy to make their flakes. He bought all the machinery. So there's absolutely no machinery for, for Kellogg's to expand with the presses and whatever it was that made these flakes. So it's a pretty rough battle. But at some point, uh, Kellogg's pulled ahead and started to blow the doors off of um, post, I guess, because they really concentrated on having a really good product, making sure that um, it was consistent and all that stuff. So, and it is convenient because everyone's moving into the cities and they didn't have time to make breakfast. So they thought pouring breakfast out of a box might be the best thing. And Mr. Post started to lose his business again and started to worry about money, even though he's a multimillionaire. Um, he went into the bedroom and blew his brains out. Uh, because he felt like he was a failure. So there's obviously something going wrong with this guy. Um, but he left all of his business to his daughter, Marjorie, um, who ended up going out and buying for millions of dollars other food companies. Uh, her first was the Bird's Eye, which cut up vegetables and froze them. So Bird's Eye became part of her empire and she bought up all these other companies and she called herself General Mills. So General Mills is post. And then from General Mills, that was bought by Kraft. So Kraft Foods now has General Mills and you'll still see post uh, on the cereals. And that's the history there. One little tidbit um, was Marjorie Post became Marjorie Weather Mary, Mer Meriwether Post who built an exquisite compound, living compound down here in Palm Beach, uh, which um, she sold to Donald Trump as what is Mar-a-Lago. That was um, Meriwether Post's um, com compound down here in Florida. And that came from Mr. Post, who stole the recipe from um, Kellogg's. So what's my point here and what's the point with horses? I, I like to tell stories to make things interesting, but the whole thing about cereals was one, it was convenient. There was two, there's no health aspect behind it to prove that eating cereals, which is grain, is healthy for us. In fact, now we're realizing that it's not that healthy, especially when you dump sugar on it, like sugar frosted flakes, or you take your spoon of sugar and you put it on there. You heap it with five pounds of you know bananas on top of it. Um, and it's got lectins in it, which are inflammatory. And there's byproducts stuck in these cereals as well. It's not just pure um, grains. 
So, and then there's dyes, you know, your colored cereals, um, your artificial flavors added. There's so many varieties in the, in the cereal aisle and all of it is not healthy to humans, but it was convenient. And a bale of hay is convenient. A bag of sweet feet is convenient. A bag of a uh, balancer is convenient. So we scoop it in. We read the directions. We put in a scoop of this, uh, a couple of scoops of that, a couple of flakes of this. And our feeding's done. We didn't have to go out in the field and, and cut it by hand. We didn't have to harvest some grains and bag it ourselves. You know, we don't have to maintain 100 acres for our 10 horses and all the fencing that goes with it, let alone the costs of it or the taxes that we have on the property. You know, there's a lot of reasons that we have gone this way. It's more convenient for our horses. But is it the right thing for our horses? That's the question we have to ask. We know that grains and cereals aren't good for humans. And yet we have them, we have the breads, we have the um, pastas, we have all of this, even though we know this sugar load is bad. I just bought a steak uh, from a local steakhouse and the potato that was on there was like a three pound potato. <laughs> it wasn't that big, but uh, my hand, my full size hand uh, easily carried this potato. I mean, it's just huge. Um, you don't need all that. <laughs> you just need maybe a little bit of it to get the glucose out of the starch of the, of the potato. But um, it tastes so good. You know, with slathered in butter, and butter, have the steak. Um, and then, of course, there's the chocolate dessert that is, comes after that if you if you so inclined. But the point is, it's convenient. I didn't have to bake a cake. I didn't have to bake bread. I didn't have to make pasta. You know, I didn't even have to raise the uh, beef steer that was slaughtered to make my steak or dig in the dirt and, and pull up a potato. I didn't have to do any of that. It's just, yeah, I got the money. I've got my food. I'm going to bed now. Um, and that's what we're doing with our horses. Here's a balancer. You know, you might not be feeding everything your horse needs. So feed our balancer. We'll fill in all the holes that you're missing. Oh, and by the way, we have this food for your senior horse because obviously senior horses need new, different nutrition than younger horses. You know, that doesn't occur here in humans. Have you ever seen, you know, a senior? Well, I can't eat that because, you know, I'm a senior now, you know? <laughs> Uh, sure, if you if you're wearing dentures and you have to have soft food, I get it. But most seniors eat the same food they're eating as a kid, right? You have the senior menu, but don't get that confused with senior food. So, and I've yet to see senior feed for squirrels or birds or fish. You know, the only senior feeds I see are basically the domestic animals, specifically horses. So it's just a marketing scheme to get us to spend money on these companies that want to basically put all the other companies out of business. They want to be the biggest and the best. Same with the Kellogg's and, or, or Hershey's. It's, it's the same thing. It really is. Um, and nobody's thinking about the human that they're feeding or the horse that they're feeding. And the point of this whole little podcast I'm putting together is I know that the message is starting to get out there. Why do I know that? Because the horse just had an article uh, they came out. I'll read it to you. I'll read you the title as soon as my. Oh, come on, really? I do this all the time. It's just. Ah, here it is. It's called High Quality Protein Understanding Amino Acids in the Equine Diet. Well, when's the last time you heard the word high quality protein? I haven't seen it anywhere. This is brand new. It must be that somebody's reading what I'm talking about and they're trying to get out there and give a different story. And I found this this uh, article is kind of fascinating because it's written by a gal who down at the very bottom, it says uh, about the author, it says that she is a uh, equine nutritionist, a master's in equine nutrition from uh, University of Guelph and started an independent nutrition company. So she owns a company that gives um, customized, balanced nutrition plans that prioritize equine well-being, both for optimal performance and solving complex nutritional issues and everything in between. 
boy, that's a nice uh, little elevator pitch that her company's doing. And part of that is marketing. She's got to market to make sure that her name gets out there. So she now has put this article out about high quality protein. And I said, this is great. So I start reading this and I was blown away. There's multiple things in here that were absolutely dead wrong. And there's a couple of things in here that were just misleading and confusing. And this just shouldn't be the way it is. So that was one study. Uh, there's another one put out by Blue Seal, and that's a big uh, grain company. And it's kind of interesting because it says soybean meal and protein in the horse diet. And they were trying to explain what soybean meal is. And it was perfect. It, in in and I usually don't like anything that's put out by a company that sells stuff. But um, it said, let's see. <laughs> There's a couple things in here. Oh, it was talking about the percent of digestible protein coming through. And uh, they, and, and the one point was so complex that I had to dig it and dig it and dig it before I could figure it out. But it basically says, if you're going to feed protein, you should limit it to what they say is 125 milligrams per kilogram body weight per feeding. Uh, and that's really what uh, they're saying in humans. You don't want to take your whole protein load at once. You want to have a maximum amount. And that's about, uh, in humans, um, 40 maybe 45 grams of protein per food uh, feeding that you have. You don't want to eat a lot more than that because you aren't able to um, – uh, use it the way it should be. So I thought that was really good. But again, companies are now talking about soybean meal and they're talking about high quality protein. And again, in there, they're using soybean meal in there and talking about amino acids. And I think this is wonderful, but they're messing it up. I mean, that's what you're getting here. You're getting, uh, you're getting me talking about um, unfiltered or interpreted information from what's out there and understanding that it's really simple. If you're going to feed your horse, feed it forage. That's it. The problem with feeding forage is you've put a fence up and because you have a fence up, you don't have the ability. The horse doesn't have the ability to migrate, to go from here to, I don't know, I'm down here in South Florida. It's getting kind of hot. I think if I were a horse, I'd be walking north and try to hang out in Kentucky with their big fields of grass and cooler weather. And as it gets colder and the north wind blows and it gets a little chilly, I'd be heading south back down to you know the southern states. That's what they did. But we can't do that because we have a fence up. Anybody who believes in natural horsemanship should take their fence down. <laughs> I say that tongue in cheek because... Um, there's nothing natural about a horse fence. There's nothing natural about keeping horses in stalls. Uh, but none of us, I should say, most of us can't afford hundreds of acres with a big per perimeter fence where we can turn our horses out, where they can graze uh, all the time. And even if we did, most of the grass that's in that, let's say you had 100 acres, it still doesn't have the variety of plants that they would get if they migrated all over several states and migrated 1,000, 1,500 miles. That's where they pick up all the different proteins that they need, the amino acids that they need to, to have a complete diet. That's what's different. So you do have to supplement because of chronic protein deficiencies in these horses. And if you're asking me, as you listen to this, how do I know if my horse has chronic protein deficiency? No, there's not a blood test you can take, but you look at the hair coat. Has it shed out uh, by you know, the middle of, you know, the first day of spring. Is it shed out? Is a hair coat shiny? Does it doesn't have a, a thriftiness to it. Does, uh, does it look alive and, and you want to just cuddle up next to it? Or is it kind of ugly and sparse and uh, wiry uh, and with no shine? A uh, horse is eating enough protein is going to have a, a long hair coat in the autumn when it puts on a winter hair coat that glows under the moonlight. That's a good hair coat. But do we have that? Do we have a top line? Are the muscles on the top line of your athletic horse athletic looking? Or is it hollow out and you're seeing the spine of the horse? That's chronic protein deficiency. Does your horse constantly break down? Meaning, does he have suspensories or tendon ligament 
tendon problems. These are chronic protein deficiencies. How about the hoof? Is it solid and strong or do the walls start to bend out? Uh, does it have chronic cracks? Does it have a poor sole? Uh, are the heels of the, of the tubules of the heels being crushed so they're not parallel with the tubules of the toe? And of course, is your horse suffering from laminitis? Uh, this is all chronic protein deficiency. Does your horse show metabolic syndrome where he has fat pads and a crusty neck? Um, does he um, have the squirts every time he defecates, you know, free fecal water syndrome? Does he have, uh, uh, does he resist being groomed? Does he swish his tail? Does he stomp his feet? When you put the girth on, does he just do the same thing and turn around and try and bite you? Uh, when you start to move him out and you're on top of him, is he starting to uh, crow hop or give you some sort of displeasure? Is he, or is he, is he a willing partner? All of these are signs of chronic prone protein deficiency and gut inflammation. Um, and you have to address them all. As your horse have horrible skin problems in the summer, fly by dermatitis, you know, it's all chronic protein deficiency and it needs to be addressed at the root level. You just don't want to be throwing steroids at everything. It's just not going to help. You have to get them healthy again. And that's what this horse's advocate is all about. That's why you're here. That's why you're listening to this stuff. I dig deep. I try to find stories that brings reality to our table. So as you're mucking your stalls or driving down the road, you're listening to me say, huh, I never thought that bailing machines weren't available until after World War II when we had industrial uh, factories to build these things and people could afford them. And so they started bailing hay at their own local place. But up until then, they were still using draft horses to plow fields. Yeah, they had bulldozers. I get it. Uh, the big industrial places in the 20s and 30s. But most people didn't have access to that until after World War II or after the Korean War in the 50s. And, and that's when we had this peacetime prosperity and all these uh, factories said, well, let's turn to making uh, tractors and bailing machines and plows and things like that. And now everybody could get one and you go to your local John Deere dealer and you'll see every size tractor from eight wheel monsters down to little lawn tractors. They've got a tractor for everything you want and a, and a financing program to fit it. But we didn't have that. We didn't have interstate systems until President Eisenhower said, hey, let's build something that'll get our military scooting around our country so we could protect it. That's how the interstate system came to being. And it wasn't completed until, and it's still not complete. They're constantly rebuilding it, still building new interstate systems, you know, at 60 years later, but they're brand new. So we have evolved so fast as a species from and all these huge cities and buildings and fancy things and rockets going up and electric cars that zip around. Um, and the fact that you're actually listening to this while working in a stall or driving. I mean, we didn't have that. We did not have that 40 years ago. I know because I was there. We just had the AM radio and then FM radio and then FM radio became stereo. I'll never forget that. Getting a tuner that could pick up a stereo signal and he tuned back and forth, just gently budging until the red light came on to indicate that you're receiving it in stereo. And of course, remote controls changed the channels. And we only had 10, 12 channels. Um, and all of a sudden now we have so many channels that, you know, you could spend the whole night just trying to find something to watch and then say, well, it's bedtime. Didn't watch anything. So thank you. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, realize as you're working with your horse that your horse has still uh, got an ancient digestive system and everything that you're doing for your horse, you have to question and say, is this in the best interest of the horse? Am I helping the horse thrive in a human world or am I actually causing it angst in, in destruction. Is a horse 10, 12, 14 years old and he's got uh, lameness issues? Does he have digestive issues? Has he got colic? Is he starting to get metabolic? Do you have Cushing's? Has it come back positive? You got him on percent? I mean, ask yourself these questions. How did a horse survive this long without us? And now they're all falling apart. And my thoughts are, just like Mr. Hershey, Mr. Uh, Otto from Curtis, and just like Mr. Kellogg and Mr. Post, uh, they're doing it for their interest, not your interest. 
And you have to understand that. And while we need to embrace the convenience of having a nice uh, dually pickup truck with a gooseneck trailer that we can haul our horses around and living quarters and have it air conditioned while we stake out our horses up in the high country and go for a, a weekend ride. Uh, that's That's wonderful. That's beautiful. But you still have to honor the fact that our digestive systems have not come along with technology. We have to slow down and honor the way we're put together. So that's my message to you today. Thank you again for stopping by. Um, I hope you're enjoying me reading Since the Days of the Romans, my autobiography of Discovering a Life with Horses. It's I'm enjoying reading it. Uh, hopefully I'm getting better at reading it. So I'm not turning you guys off. I'll put out a couple more chapters um, and we'll just keep interspersing these things. And maybe um, by the fall, I'll put them all together as one continuous uh, audio book for members of the Horses Advocate. In the meantime, go to thehorseadvocate.com, consider becoming a member, uh, look at it as a, a contribution to maintaining all these websites and reaching somebody. Um, and I'm, I, I know we're going to have some really cool stuff coming up. We already have uh, twice a month, or I should say every other Thursday night at 8 p.m. live, Ask Me Anythings, uh, where I discuss something or I talk about uh, whatever questions you guys have that you want to talk about. And uh, that's my goal is to educate and to help others uh, help others. And uh, together, we're going to help horses thrive in a human world. Thanks again for stopping by, Doc T. See ya. Hey, everyone. Doc T here. Thank you for listening to my content. Would you do me a huge favor? Would you please subscribe, comment, like, thumbs up, and give a star review? However it's presented to you, I want you to do that. There are two reasons. The first, of course, is to improve this product. This way I know what you like, what you don't like, what I can improve upon, what topics you want me to cover. But more importantly, it's also gonna help others find me. And by doing that, you are now engaged in this mission of helping horses thrive in a human world. By you helping, we can reach others. And that I would be so grateful for. And remember, go to thehorsesadvocate.com for updates on this information. Thehorsesadvocate.com. And again, thank you so much for being here. Talk to you out.